Tom's going to Tom's going to call him out, and you can do the five. Six one. That works. I'd like to make an announcement. We're going to limit everyone's comments to three minutes again tonight, just because of the size of the crowd. So if you could please be diligent about that, that would be much appreciated, because we have a lot to get through here tonight. I'd like to bring the October 10th, 2022 Whitehall Township Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Please stand for Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And if we could have a moment of silence for our troops, our first responders, and the people of Ukraine. Whitehall Township has an obligation to affirmatively further fair housing and to review all land use applications in accordance with federal civil rights statutes. This includes taking meaningful actions that overcome pat patterns of segregation and foster inclusive communities free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity based on protected characteristics. The township and its land use decisions does not discriminate against persons based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, or familiar status, and reviews all land use applications in accordance with federal civil rights statutes. Public comments made on the basis of bias and stereotype concerning people within these protected classes will not be taken into consideration by the township in its deliberations. And I have a motion to approve the minutes. Second. And I have a second. I'll second, Fisher. Please call the board. Commissioner Warren. Aye. Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Commissioner Atia. Yes. Commissioner Roman. Yes. Commissioner Sloniger. Aye. Commissioner Ginder. Yes. Madam President. Yes. Voting is seven ayes, zero nays. We are going to move. We have Allie's presentation to the front for courtesy of the floor. So if the gentleman from Lehigh Valley would like to come forward. And I think the way we're going to do it is we'll let them make their presentation. Then everyone can come up. They'll be called by the secretary. Uh, three minutes. Please keep your comments to three minutes. Mr. Atia will be timed. I think what I'll, what I'll do is at a 10 seconds left, I'll just give a knock. I don't like to interrupt anybody while they're speaking, but just to give a friendly reminder that there's 10 seconds left, and then you can finish up your, your comments. Thank you. Mr. Schneider? I have an item on the council report of Second John Wilder. Have that on so the council. Can I have to address it, please? Uh, yes. You can come forward now. Can I see the speaker marks? Yes. I also have one for the guys in the white shirts. Okay, Mr. Pledgian. You decided to limit it to. If you could please state your name and I address. I forgot again. Sorry. And please speak into the microphone so we can get it recorded. Ken Snyder, 4272 Abigail Lane in Whitehall. Um, you've elected to eliminate this to three minutes, which is your arrangement to do that. Um, I attended the meeting for a very brief time at the, at the uh, Whitehall Bell Bible Fellowship looking for the ordinance that you're going to be discussing tonight, and there was no copy there. I asked for a copy to be given to me at the municipal building on Friday, and it was denied. And it was denied by the solicitor, and I was told I had to file a right to know to get the information that you're discussing tonight, so I have no copy. So if you're going to limit me to three minutes because I didn't have the copy to review the previous notes, I think that's very unfair. Mr. Gross, if you could comment on this. I didn't deny it, uh, President Marks. The, the, there was a request for information. The township, that's state law. Now, I, I did um, understand, or I, it was my original understanding that, that uh, copy, that a, a package had been also, also made available to the um, township secretary. I, I, I found out today that she didn't have one. 
I had heard the board in the past say that it would be available in the secretary's office, but I'm not aware of any exception in this case that says this should have been handled outside of the ordinary right to know process. If Mr. Snyder was, he was asking for a copy to be sent to him. No, very simple. I walked in the building, I asked for a copy of the motion that's being discussed tonight on the overlay zone. I was told that it has to be approved by the solicitor and checked it out. I got an email today saying that I had to file a right to know at three o'clock this afternoon. I filed my right to know information and I have not had a copy. So, with this big group in here that we're gonna be voting on, and we don't know what the heck they're talking about, and since I've been involved with this since January, the only thing that I have to go off is what I had previously. So I'm gonna ask that I do not only have three minutes, but I can go through on the list because you did not give me the information necessary to prepare for tonight's meeting. And that's only fair. And After. the same to everybody else in this room that doesn't have a hill of beans of what's going on. Okay, why don't we play it this way? We'll let Lehigh Valley make their presentation. I'm fine with that. And then courtesy of the floor, you can I'm fine with that make too. your comments and we'll take it from there. And the only reason I ask to be heard now is that if you want to make copies of it and disperse it, you're welcome to do so, but I think it was very unfair that I was not able to get a copy and I want to know why that decision was made today. I think Celestia has a right to explain and whoever else is involved. I believe I have it in front of me. Well, said it's Request Please, was, uh, Mr. Snyder, now it's my turn. You said Go ahead. I get an opportunity to explain. The request was made for a document the township has. This is no, no, no different than any other document. When that request is made, there is a procedure. The procedure is to submit a right to no request. I, I didn't have the authority to waive that procedure. So you're telling me that I can, I can, that anybody walks in here and wants to have a copy of anything that's going in here, they got to file a right to know to get the information of what's on the agenda. Is that what you're saying? Because that's not true because you've given copies out previously. I know you have. That's how I got this one. This is not an ordinance on the agenda. This is a discussion item. No, it's a motion. It was listed on the agenda as a, a discussion and a motion. That's what it says. I, Mr. Snyder, I have, I have no motion in my packet. If you go to your agenda. Right. On, it says there. It does. Look, at, look, at, look at. I can only go by what was given to me. I went to your agenda and it says that there's a motion tonight. So therefore, if there's a motion, there had to be something that's going on. So I asked for that information. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, now, if there's no motion, that's fine, but that's not what your agenda said. It would just be a board motion, I believe. I Any, anybody Bill, from the board here could make a motion to go one way or the other. other. I understand. But there is no, yeah, I just went through my packet too. There is no. I only went by what's on the agenda. There's a motion tonight to discuss, and based on previous things that was done, I'm assuming that LVH has been asked you to prepare a motion to either accept or reject based on previous meetings that occurred, which is logical on their side of the table, I'm perfectly fine with, but I do feel that the community should have a right to review that overlay document in advance to answer questions because it's been told by that group that the, that the document has been altered from the time original, which is perfectly fine. I'm only asking to read it so I know exactly what's in and not in, that's all. It's a whole new proposal they brought forward. Bill, I agree. The one that was turned down in May. This is all new, I, and I, it's it's not an ordinance or a resolution. I really don't want to. And it, it's right. going to be done through their presentation, and then you might then it's saying, oh, oh I should ask about this or not ask about that. No, this, it's not because it, it hasn't been. No, before. because it's nothing that we have written. What they bring to us today is we're going to be seeing it for most people up here the first time. I obviously and Mr. Warren saw part of it last, uh, what was it, Thursday. 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 So, but we've never gotten any material here. It was just what was presented there, period. Nothing At the else. workshop session, are you telling me that at tonight's meeting, you do not have a copy of the overlay that the hospital is going to be presenting to you tonight? I have a dated copy. That's okay, but you have a copy. That's more than I have. That's all I'm saying. So when you sit down and say that it is or is not, the group on the last meeting specifically said that the behavioral science, uh, behavioral facility was removed. Now that could be interpreted two ways. And I'm looking at the document to find out what it says. The maps that were in that fellowship manner are different than what I have in my packet. So it's, 
infringement. You're trying to get something that we don't have, but you wanted it first. That's not true. Well, that's what, you're, that's what you're asking for, Mr. That is absolutely Schein. not true, and I resent that because well, I, don't, I don't mind what date that you resent copy of, it. What date is the copy of the information? I think we need have? to move on. Pardon me? I think we need to move on. No, I want to know, I, I want to know why you have information. I think we have a presentation you. that we have to see. Say it again? I think we have a presentation we have to see. No, you have the ordinance, and in your ordinance. We do not have an ordinance, sir. There's an ordinance. I don't there is no what ordinance is it yet. You don't understand. There is no ordinance. Tom, I'll tell you what I don't understand. You ready for go, this? Go ahead. Starting in January, with all the things that have not gone right in this meeting up to this point that was not dis disclosed, or things that the group of commissioners did not know that the administration knew that wasn't told to you, gives me cause to ask that question. And that's a fair assessment. And I'm not going back to rehash that. That's, that's a fair assessment. This kind of, we don't have. What you're saying we have. So you don't I have. Don't have to, I don't have tomorrow's winning lottery number either. So in, you're, in your way of thinking, well, somebody already Mr. has Mr. Marks, that. do you have a copy of the proposed overlay? Just yes or no? Yes. From yes. August 29th. From August 29th. Yes. And is that is what's going to be reviewed tonight by? No. This is a revised proposal. So tonight is another revised one? Yes. You do not have a copy of the that? The overlay doesn't change in its overall scope. The only thing that changed was their proposal. Agreed. So their propo the overlay zone still exists, correct? Correct. The first proposal they gave you had a whole pile of stuff that was in January and February. Correct. You got another one in August, which you had, correct? Right. And then there's another one that apparently is going to be given to you tonight, which is different, that I'm assuming they're going to hand you for the first time. I presume that. I would not expect to have that copy. Right. I agree. I'm perfectly fine. But the one that was in August, then I would have expected to get a copy of that if one existed. Or I should have been told there's none to give me because it doesn't exist. Not file a right to know. Now, be honest. Come on, guys. I did what I was told to do. I didn't know. If the response coming back would have been said, there's nothing to do. It's going to be presented tonight. I would not be standing here arguing this point. I wasn't told that. So all I'm asking you to do is as you go through this process, be a little transparent so me, myself, and everybody else in this room understands exactly what's going on. Now that I have understood. That's, you could have it, Tom. That we're not transparent. I don't know anybody on this board that goes ahead and says, well, we better not tell the public this or that. We go with what we can do, what's legal. That's as simple as it is. Well, then you this and I will not differ, Mr. Sloniker. you accuse all of these people up here of not being transparent. That's what we strive to do. The fact that it doesn't help you right now because you think certain things have been done doesn't, doesn't make it so. I followed your procedures that I was told to follow, and I'm standing here with different information that was given to me. To me, that's not transparent. I'm sorry. I don't know where you got that information from. His answer was that I had to follow right to know. That's the answer that I got, and I'm fine with that. But if you have this information that you're going to review tonight, I just think that the public should be sitting here and looking at page 22. Like I said, we do not yeah. have I accept any that as an answer. I accept that as an answer. I should have been told that when I got that. I wasn't. That's all. Understood. Fair enough? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pelligian. Name, rank, and serial number, whatever, whatever you would like to say. Good evening, commissioners. Is this on? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, sorry. Rob Pelligian, 415 Oakwood Drive. Been in front of you a number of times. Uh, I want to keep it brief. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about anything to do with Lehigh Valley Hospital. So, number one, uh, I have a couple questions and a statement. First question is the status of the treasurer's audit. I've been that. told, well, let me ask my questions because okay. I'm limited to three minutes and I don't want to go past that. Mr. Atia might spank my hand or something. <laughs> Number two, the status of the alleged sexual harassment charges against the mayor, what the status of that is. And then number three, uh, I put this off for a couple of months to afford uh, some time to have the mayor present, but there was a Facebook posting that was done following a, a tragic accident on July 31st on MacArthur Road. And unfortunately, it's signed by Mayor Mike Harrichel uh, as a public official. And uh, I can paraphrase it. I can read it out loud if you want to hear it, but I'd rather not. But a comment was one of the sentences is, her lawless, out of control, and reprehensible murderers have her death on their hands. Now, 
it was published in the news media that they were motorcyclists that were involved in this tragic accident. Um, but to use the term murderers is a slap in the face of every motorcyclist. And if anybody happened to look out in the parking lot, there's a motorcycle out there and that's my motorcycle. And I've been a motorcyclist for years and years and years. And I can show you the scars on my hand where I was in an accident where one of the uh, apparently safe drivers, because they're not murderers like motorcyclists are, uh, went through a stop sign. I ended up on the hood of the car while the car was still driving. And I had two surgeries on this wrist. So I take personal offense to this murderer nonsense. And Mr. Uh, Mayor Harrickle removed this Facebook post soon thereafter. Uh, I find it reprehensible. So. Would you like me to address that? Sure. I, I'd be happy to. Um, one, um, that was directed specifically to those people who were exceeding the uh, speed limit by double. So, so a speed, and, somebody speeding, now wait, now wait, because we're going to take this one I, at a time, okay. Mr. I'm Mr. Harrick. Well, Mayor Harrickle, the, the, the fact of the matter is, I mean, you, you were judge, jury, and calling them murderers. I've actually talked to the police, the police chief Follow, at the last at the meeting following this tragic accident, he said they hadn't even completed their their investigation. And uh, to say that anybody would be charged with murder, I'm not a law expert, I'm not a lawyer, I don't pretend to be one, but vehicular homicide, perhaps. But to use the term murderer is a slap in the face. Period. The, the reason I removed that was I was in a very emotional state at the moment. Um, I would not have said that under any other circumstance, but it offended me to find a 16-year-old girl dead. It offends everybody. No fault of her own. It offends everybody, and Mr. I Mayor. I certainly but, but did not intend yeah. that that be projected to everybody who's driving a motorcycle. Well, when you're when and you think, when Rob, you sign when you, you no now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Okay. Mayor, when you sign something as the mayor. You're speaking as a township official, and that is completely inappropriate. You are held to a higher standard. In my opinion, you are held to a higher standard. And to, to make a Facebook page, the internet lasts forever. We've all learned that. So anyway. Can we move on then? Please. Okay. Can you all answer right. my questions though? Uh, yes, I am doing that as we speak. Thank you. Okay, I received a letter from uh, Deputy Mayor Jack Myers on July 12th. It says, this is pertaining to the audit of the treasurer's office that was ordered in July. Please know uh, this letter is, comes from Deputy Mayor Myers. Please know that I, um, that I met this morning via Zoom with representatives from RKO, the township auditor. The purpose of this was to discuss the audit of the township, the treasurer's office for the year ending December 31st, 2021. This audit was required under the township code of ordinances as required whenever there is a change in the elected position of treasurer. RKL representatives included field auditor, I won't name the names. To summarize the meeting, RKL will be unable to produce a completed audit for the 2021 fiscal year. The simple reason being that is there were no comprehensive set of records which would provide the auditors with the necessary information to produce such a document. The principle among the deficiencies was that there was no bank reconciliation performed to confirm the accuracy of transactions which occurred throughout the year. In fact, there were no bank statements for any of the accounts under the treasurer's control. Were it not for Treasurer Corrin printing the statements, they would not exist in the office as of today. Most assuredly, if one does not even have a bank, bank statements, a reconciliation of the accounts cannot occur. Of note, the deputy treasurer prepared the reports and deposits and maintained the accuracy of the garbage, real estate, and per capita records. It appears all this work was performed proper, properly. The reports were provided to the treasurer and the remainder of the work product was to come from the treasurer. However, there are no confirmed deposit slips from the bank to audit and the, to audit the completion of these transactions. There are other issues re raised, which RKL will be providing a written response to the Board of Commissioners concerning internal controls, process and procedures. One example involves 60 deleted transactions and garbage records. Upon reviewing the report, 
presented by RKL, which involved a garbage account, one cannot state that anything nefarious occurred. However, most of the deletions were not supported by detail, receipts, or physical documentation. In fact, all the deletions could be, support, could be supported, but the physical records and paperwork were not found. To summarize, in order to conduct a proper audit, RKL must rely upon the, the responsible party, in this case, the elected treasurer, to reconcile the deposits, transfers, and other activity for each bank account under their control. The bank statement must be compared with the physical records retained in the office. Since there are no bank statements, it is obvious there is no reconciliation of the statements was performed. Without this, RKL cannot audit records which do not exist. I will forward RKL's letter to the board upon receipt. It will explain in greater detail the insurmountable problems they faced and why a proper accounting of 2021 cannot be performed in the form of the audit. Now, if you bear with me, on July 22nd, we received that letter from RKL, and I will read that. If everyone could please be patient. Sorry about this. I can honestly say in all my years going to these meetings, I've never heard it so quiet for so long. Okay, I got it. Sorry, everyone. I have a lot of stuff here. Okay, this is from RKL. This is the auditing firm. This letter is intended to inform the board of the status of the audit process and to communicate certain matters related to the audit of the tax collector of Whitehall Township and the related financial statements and supplementary information as and as for the year ended December 31st, 2021. Per the arrangement letter dated July 7, 2022, RKL LLP was engaged to perform an audit of the financial records of the tax, tax collector of Whitehall Township. RKL is engaged to perform an audit of cash receipts and disbursements in order to obtain reasonable assurance whether or not the financial statements as a whole are free from material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error, and to issue an auditor's report that includes our opinion. This requires RKL to obtain an understanding of internal controls relevant to the audit and to evaluate the appropriateness of accounting policies used in developing the financial statements. We commenced the audit process in July 2022 
and attempted to perform audit procedures at the tax collector's office for financial reports. In order to complete the procedures, RKL requested documentation listed below. However, management was unable to provide us with the required documentation as outlined below. Number one, access to the December 2020 bank statement and related reconciliation in order to confirm the opening balance. Given the engagement in an initial audit, management was unable to provide this statement as a tax collector during 2021 did not maintain any bank statements. Number two, access to bank reconciliations for the entire year ended December 31st, 2021. Management was unable to provide these statements as the tax collector during 2021 did not prepare or maintain bank reconciliations or any other listings of deposits, disbursements, or in-transit items. Number three, access to bank deposit slips for the year ended December 31st, 2021. Management was unable to provide deposit slips verifying funds were appropriately deposited as the tax collector during 2021 did not maintain any deposit slips from the bank. Number four, access to the 2021 checks disbursements or canceled checks. Management was unable to provide only a few crumpled checks from a storage box in the basement. RKL notes that due to their condition, these checks were not legible. Number five, access to reimbursement reports from districts for expenses. Management was unable to provide such reports as the tax collector during 2021 did not maintain such documentation. Number six, certificates indicating any exonerations granted. Management was unable to provide the documentation to support or verify exonerations were properly granted as a tax collector during 2021 did not maintain any supporting documentation. Acts, number seven, access to the tax collector's monthly reports to the township for 2021. RKL notes that these reports were provided, but there was no indication of dates when the reports were submitted as part of the audit. In order to determine if remittances were in compliance with the local tax collector law, we need proper documentation in order to determine if remittances were made in accordance with enacted laws and ordinances. RKL was unable to obtain such documentation as the tax collector during 2021 did not maintain any. Number eight, access to the report submitted to the tax bureau for delinquents accounts turned over for collection as of December 31st, 2021. RKL was unable to obtain these reports. However, per discussions with management, it is noted that in 2022, many township taxpayers contacted the tax collector's office to dispute, to dispute these claims, stating that they had already paid their bills. The tax collector currently in office for 2022 was able to confirm these residents had indeed already paid their bills. So, as such, RKL is, RKL is unable to gain comfort in the completeness and accuracy of these reports provided. Number nine, access to the tax collector's checkbook from 2021. Management was unable to provide this as a tax collector during 2021 did not maintain a checkbook. Additionally, through discussions with management, issues were brought to RKL's attention. During 2021, all receipts and disbursements were manually collected and updated into the system. It was noted that receipts were not entered into the system timely with some receipts not being entered into the system for months. As such, it cannot be determined if payment receipt records are complete and accurate. Additionally, the lack of documentation, document maintenance resulted in a significant amount of funds being issued by the current tax collector in relation to the 2021 tax year. During 2021, passwords and computers were shared across the tax office. As such, we are unable to conclude with reasonable insurance who performed what duties. Number 10, during 2021, it was represented to RKL that the tax collector was rarely present in the office. As such, bank deposits did not occur daily within a timely manner. Through discussions with management, it is noted that the cash was left in drawers and checks were not stamped for deposit only on a daily or timely basis. RKL also notes that during 2021, cash payments were not supposed to be accepted. As such, cash maintained within the tax office is not in compliance with the stated policies. Number 11, management indicated the tax collection process, processing room was left unlocked at all times 
and without cameras through 2021. Access to the processing room appears to have been unfettered. Number 12, it was indicated the tax collector storage room in the basement was left unlocked. RKL notes that this storage unit is now locked, but observed that all other storage units were left with the doors propped open for anyone to access. 13, RKL obtained a deleted transaction report for 2021, listing out 59 deleted payment transactions from the system. Per discussion with management, deleted transactions should rarely occur. Additionally, there is no log or documentation of approval, justification, or reconciliations related to these deleted transactions. At this time, the validity of deleted transactions is not determinable. Number 13, management indicated the tax collector's office would accept check payments with discrepancies under 50 cents. Taxpayers would only be contacted to submit another payment if the discrepancy was greater than 50 cents. Due to the aforementioned, there is sufficient documentation available for RKL to perform the procedures as outlined in the agreement letter dated July 7, 2022. At this time, the lack of documentation precludes RKL from performing, performing sufficient audit procedures to obtain reasonable assurance over the tax collector's financials and perform an audit for the tax collector's office for the year ended December 31st, 2021. Now, moving forward to September, it was requested by the solicitor that we reach out, we sent a letter to the ex-treasurer informing her that we needed this information that pertained to RKL's request. There was a meeting set up. There was an associate of Mr. Gross's from his law firm that met at the treasurer's office with the current treasurer and Mrs. Gover. They went through the office. They went through the storage areas to give her the opportunity to show us where the missing documentation was. According to Mr. Gross's associate, nothing was found. So I will read his brief report from the September 27th meeting, and we will move on from there. Sorry, I'm out of breath. Uh, this memorandum is from Jacob Olachter. I take it he's an attorney in your firm? He's an attorney in my office. Okay. In response to RKL's letter, date dated July 12, 2022, I attended a meeting at the Whitehall Township Municipal Building between Tina Corrin, our current treasurer, and Colleen Gober, our ex-treasurer. The purpose of this meeting was for Gober to help locate the missing documents requested by RKL. Gober was amicable to meeting and attempted to be helpful, but no additional documentation was located. The letter states that in order for RKL to complete their audit, the documentation list below must be provided. And it's the same thing that I just reviewed. So in his opinion, he sums it up that Gober states that everything RKL is requesting was in Corrin's office upon Gober's departure. She specifically states that she spent the final days of 2022, 2021 organizing everything that Corrin would need to provide for the audit. Gober's statement is that Everything that RKL re requested is in the black filing cabinets, miscellaneous boxes, or in binders, all within Corrin's office. Gober stated that everything was neatly organized for this transition to Corrin. Corrin confirmed that there were black filing cabinets and miscellaneous boxes in her office when she arrived. According to Corrin, everything that Gober left behind was not in a neat and orderly condition, as Gober stated, but was haphazardly lying around the office. Corrin documented the state of the office and was able to show me pictures of her first day. Corrin states that she reviewed everything that Gober left in the office, but was unable to locate the requested documents. According to Corrin, Rose, one of our employees, was responsible for removing the old boxes and filing cabinets from Corrin's office, but no longer worked for the township. 
Corin provided Gober and me with access to the basement storage room and we were able to confirm that the boxes Colleen left behind had been moved to the storage room. Unfortunately, after our review, all potentially relevant boxes, we did not locate any additional documentation other than what was already provided to RKO. Now, where we're at with this is, Deputy Mayor Myers has another letter out to RKO asking if we could create what, what documents we can reproduce. And would that be substantially enough in order to have this audit performed? We believe that we're not gonna be able to create the documentation that is necessary to have the audit performed. Now, I reached out to Attorney Gross this afternoon. We had a discussion. Uh, the only avenue we have to rectify this problem there are state statutes, and I don't know if Mr. Gross wants to chime in here at all. Uh, public officials have a fiduciary responsibility to do their job. Uh, they took an oath of office. It's obvious with this information that that practice wasn't followed. There's also state records retention laws that public officials have to go by. I reached out to Chief Marks today He's researching the state statutes and the criminal code to see what charges can possibly brought, be brought forward. And I will contact the district attorney and the appropriate authorities moving forward, and hopefully we can get resolution on this audit. Now, second question. Uh, we're, done, we're not done there, are we? Uh, if you would like to comment. Well, when did the former employee stop working at the treasurer's office? No, it was March of 2022. So that was the person that moved the boxes <coughs> to the basement. Okay, and so this audit was requested sometime in July. Correct. So the information requested in July, the boxes were already gone from your office. Okay, that's, that's the question I have. I will say, I, I was told there were no boxes in there. <laughs> I was also told there were boxes in there, but they were empty. And now I'm told that there were boxes that were moved to the basement. So which is it? Is there, I was told there was nothing in that office when you took office. It was in disarray. Then I was told there were, oh, there were boxes, but they were empty. That was a conversation we had last week. Mr. Warren, I'll go, I'll go back to January 2nd, the day that Mrs. Corrin took yeah. over, the day she officially started as Whitehall Township Treasurer. Mrs. Corrin contacted me immediately when she came into the building that morning, told me that she felt that possibly something nefarious had happened in the office. I immediately contacted Chief Marks in the Whitehall Police Department. Ms. Corrin also called the police oh, department. I know that. A patrolman, the right. people don't know. I'm talking about the boxes though. Okay. That was in the paper. In the let, let, okay. let me explain. Right. Uh, Whitehall police officer responded, didn't know the levity of the situation, that's why I contacted Chief Marks. The officer took a report and said he would give it to his lieutenant or, or sergeant. I asked Chief Marks to intervene and come down and physically witness what was going on in the office. Myself and Commissioner Roman also came in. We met Chief Marks, we met uh, Treasurer Corrin. She took us into the office. I wanted law enforcement there as a witness. We went in and talked to the staff and Mrs. Corrin. She showed me exactly what she had found in the office. I witnessed it personally as did Mr. Roman. We witnessed four empty boxes in the back storage room with a large commercial garbage bag full of shredded materials. Other than that, Ms. Corrin produced a couple check ledgers that were ineligible. I couldn't even read or tell you what were on them. And other than that, I saw nothing in the office that morning. Mrs. Corrin also took pictures and she has evidence of how she found that office. When me and Mr. Roman were in the office, we talked to the four employees. Only three are currently employed by the township. One, unfortunately, left us. They had indicated to us that the ex-treasurer told them that basically she would show us, you know, she wasn't gonna make the transition easy and she would show us or pay us back for whatever it may be. 
So there are three currently employed township employees that I am going to request law enforcement interview to hear their side of the story because they were witnesses to the actions of the ex-treasurer. And if law enforcement, whoever it may be, the district attorney, the Whitehall police, the FBI, whoever decides to take this on, it's in their hands. It's in law enforcement's hands. I was confused about the boxes because I've heard three different things. That's why I asked the question. saying is all right thank you it's a mixture of all right okay thank you pertaining to the mayor's misconduct or whatever we want to turn allegations october 24th in philadelphia we will be meeting for mediation with the plaintiffs we will represent the township myself and mr ginner mr gross the mayor has his own representation the plaintiffs have their representation and we have a mediator what the outcome may be, I cannot predict at this time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. President Marks, I'd like to just um, speak on one of Mr. Pudgian's questions and just go on record. Just jotted a few notes down that I wanted to put in the record because um, I think it's important that everybody here in the room, um, I'm sure there's some concerns and I just want to address that. Um, I apologize to everybody in the room and in the township. I've been shocked and disappointed myself once elected and notified of some of the issues in the treasurer's office at that time. Um, I've seen this type of stuff in little league youth organizations, um, booster clubs, but not, not in a township. Everyone in this room in Whitehall deserves better. The foundation here needs to be built on trust and I can understand why there may be a lack of trust. That being said, I can tell you that this board has followed our legal advice and law enforcement this entire time. The unfortunate truth is we may never truly be able to provide cold hard facts of what took place. As elected officials, I know that you may want more, but as a tax paying resident myself, I too expect more. Thank you. Well said. I would just like to close on this and I, I, I take no pleasure in this, but we have a charter for a reason, and we are bound by our charter. That's our rule book. That's what we live by. This audit in no way reflects back to the first situation that took place in 2018. This is currently calling out a public official for not doing their fiduciary duties and their sworn oath. That's all that this is about. We are obligated as a board to follow our charter and follow it to the T. Because we can't perform this audit because the aggregate information isn't available, I feel strongly as the board president that moving forward, we take the necessary measures to end this and put this to bed for once and for all. Full transparency, I want our public to know that we are here as the watchdogs for our citizens. And with that said, that's all I have. Yeah, I would like to add one more thing. Um, last year I did request that an audit be performed every year on the treasurer's office and this approved that unanimously after a request for two months. Um, this audit we knew was going to happen. It didn't start until July. So I'd like to see going forward that there's information gathered that it's not July again, that Absolutely. in January the, the information is starting to be bundled. And when there is, is a transition from one treasurer to the other, before that treasurer leaves that there is a transition uh, meeting, plan, and all documents that are needed are made available at that time before, um, you know, I think time, time passed and uh, it would have been, I would have rather been addressed in January than in July. I agree. And, and, and that just isn't going to happen within law firms because they have end of year audits, 1231 audits that have to be performed. So those work, that work takes priority over any special audits that a company might have, and you would have difficulty finding anybody that could do it until at least April. I'm not saying the audit, I'm saying the information. Bank statements, reconciliation oh. reports, things of that nature. There were six months that have passed, and boxes were moved by ex-employees, and I think it just, 
I feel better if we were gathering that information and not waiting until the audit comes in on the day one that it's made available. But if that information doesn't exist, where do you get it? Well, we wait until July. I have one other comment on this. By home rule charter, every time there's a change in the treasurer's office, in other words, a new treasurer is elected, there is an audit done. That has been going on since the mid 70s when we adopted the, the home rule charter in Whitehall. Uh, so auditing the treasurer's office, this isn't something new. Uh, what Commissioner Warren asked for and the whole board agreed to, we had talked about this many times before, especially in LNL, doing an annual audit of the treasurer from, from that day forward. But audits were done over the years Thank when you. there was a change in the office. So it's, it's, the audits are nothing new. And unfortunately, this situation was different than the others. There wasn't a smooth transition of power, and there wasn't cooperation between the parties. And that's how we ended here. Okay, moving on. Would I the gentleman I, from... I did say something to say that I... I addressed my comments to the board in a letter. I'd like to have that letter be made part of the record, too, because I believe the uh, person in question here, Colleen Gopher, needs to be held accountable. And if, if a criminal investigation does not come up with sufficient evidence, I think a civil uh, suit should be filed to make the, pay, the taxpayers of Whitehall whole again. But I'd like my letter to be part of the record as well. Thank you. Would it be best if that, if what you want written in the minutes under commissioner's comments, you get it in under your commissioner's comments? Sure. That way it just doesn't hang here in the middle of everything. It's it's stated in the in the comments and, yeah, and I those are. My letter is part of the record. I don't know. That would just be my opinion with it. That you know, it doesn't get lost. You you can. Is it acceptable for you to read that during your comments? Um, I don't have it in front of me now. I have it. Okay, I, I can provide it for you. Okay, cool. Okay. I'll do that. Would the gentleman from Lehigh Valley like to come forward? They're going to make their presentation, uh -huh. and then we're going to do. Okay, thank you. We're going to do close. Just getting some. Good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, and we've appeared before, but again, my name is Graham Simmons from Norris McLaughlin. I'm the attorney for the applicant. Just one thing that I did want to clarify while they're setting up the easels. Um, so originally, back in uh, May, following a recommendation for denial by the uh, LNL committee, um, this body took no action in terms of the rezoning request. And so uh, on August 29th, that's when a revised proposal, a revised uh, amendment to the zoning map and zoning ordinance itself was submitted to the township. Um, that draft amendment to the zoning ordinance was dated August 26, 2022. This evening, you're not going to hear any changes to that draft ordinance itself, but uh, rather what you're going to hear are changes based on new information that uh, the hospital and the engineers have garnered in terms of what Lehigh Valley Health Network would plan to do assuming that the township would be willing to move forward on the rezoning process. Now, again, to be clear tonight, um, this is not a vote to approve this proposed rezoning ordinance. All we were looking to do is move forward in the process to the Planning Commission. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Ed Doherty from Lehigh Valley Health Network. Thank you, and uh, good evening, commissioners. We appreciate the opportunity uh, to present uh, for the record, Ed Doherty, I'm the uh, Chief Business Development Officer at Lehigh Valley Health Network. The proposal is uh, two parts. I'll, I'll talk through it, walk through a couple of pieces here on the, uh, on the easel. Uh, we're talking about developing a, a medical campus, a healthcare campus, that includes a hospital with 24 ER uh, bays, 24 inpatient rooms, with uh, surgery capabilities, inpatient care, ambulatory care, and the, uh, the health center, the medical office building would be 60,000 square feet where we would have an increased number of physicians and other uh, physician services and other uh, diagnostics. 
the goal here is to meet the changing demographics of the area we have a large number of people in the sixty five plus category who need care we also are the fastest growing lehigh county is the fastest growing county in the state on a percentage basis in the growth of residents between the ages of eighteen and thirty four so we have demographic pressures relative to uh, the, the amount of demand for health care services across the region. On top of that, uh, we also have uh, the need relative to the development of, of overall services to meet the community need. We're working to be able to take some of our campuses such as Cedar Crest and Muhlenberg, where they have the highest of acuity services, and give them room to be able to develop those services further. We've examined um, the overall activity from Whitehall and about 80 to 85 percent of the care that people have gone to Muhlenberg or Cedar Crest could be received at this campus, saving a lot of time. Research has shown that when you have m care more readily available, people will take advantage of it and typically receive a health care intervention sooner rather than later. So we have a, a number of different um, uh, act forces within the community from demographics to the changing uh, nature of care delivery that are uh, part of the motivation for why we need a, a healthcare campus in Whitehall. We have made a number of changes from what we had submitted last year and was discussed through last May. Among those, uh, among those changes, we took the maximum height of the building on any building on the campus uh, down to four stories. We, uh, in the cover letter, had identified that uh, we're in the process of acquiring what had been uh, Whitehall Township Authority land uh, that was next to, uh, to, to this land. As stated in our cover letter, we said we would do two things. One, we would leave the tree line as is, so it would be undisturbed, and we would also build the berm that we had talked about from the very beginning. Additionally, there are setbacks outlined in the draft ordinance. Those setbacks would be calculated from our current property lines. In other words, that would, we're A, saying that the tree line would be there, and B, saying any calculations of setbacks starts on the other side of the trees from any of the residents nearby. So that's giving them additional buffering, additional spacing. When you put all this together, the distance from the backyards to the front door of the hospital is about three full football fields, including the end zones. So we have significant spacing and we'll leave the trees in place. The other part is uh, previously we'd had um, behavioral health, a freestanding behavioral health facility as, as part of the use in phase one. We also had a restaurant pad. We removed both of those and we said that it, any other changes in subsequent phases would be subject to uh, conditional use requirement and review. So those were you know, significant changes. As we've had further conversation, we had a lot of input a week ago tonight. Uh, I was unable to attend, but got a good debriefing. And then we had a meeting uh, at Fellowship Community last Thursday, got additional feedback. And what I'd like to do is go to the easel and walk through a couple of key elements here in terms of trying to address concerns that have come up. We believe there's a way to provide for improved uh, ease of access to healthcare services and to address some of the, a number of the traffic concerns that have, have come up over the last week in particular. Is this microphone portable? Uh, yeah, you can pull that out. Thanks. I'm sorry I have my back to you. Uh, I don't want to. We're good. We, we have a copy up here we can review. And okay. I don't want to <laughs> hit anybody in the face. So uh, the, <coughs> the hot... You would like to turn it around so... Just turn around. So they can see it. We'll okay. manage with what we have. Yeah. Okay. So just to set where we are, MacArthur Road. Here's the Lehigh Street 
intersection. The hospital is the blue building back here, medical office back here. We have exits, entrances uh, and exits right in, right out, coming off MacArthur here. There would be an entrance. These use already existing curb cuts. If you've driven by there, PennDOT already has those in. So we, these use what is already there. We are in the process of acquiring this strip of land from the cemetery, and that would allow for a third point of entrance over here to come down to Mechanicsville, with the idea being of taking anyone coming to this hospital, coming from the west, would turn in here and start to take some of the stress off of Mechanicsville there. Any of this future development would be subject to the conditional use and also to the limitations of traffic uh, that would be available to us. So again, tree line in here would stay. There would be a berm and you can see different dotted lines here in terms of how far back uh, we would go in terms of any other buildings before they could be built. We can't put a four-story building here. You have to put them further back. So we, we've put a plan here to provide spacing. And the reality, again, is traffic is the big limiter, right? So that's, that's the first component. The helipad is right back here. And so let, let, me, let, let me tell you about the helipad. This campus is modeled very similarly to what we have at Hecktown Oaks, okay? The original submission essentially mirrored Hecktown Oaks. In the first year of, uh, first year that Hecktown Oaks was open, we had a total of, where's Dan, nine, nine flights from, the, from that helipad. Every one of those flights involved someone in critical condition who needed to be uh, transferred to a higher level of care immediately. If there's, if there's a flight, any of the beacons related to the helipad, and again, we're talking more than three football fields away, the beacons are activated when there is a landing, there's a takeoff, they're supposed to be turned off. If they're not turned off immediately, there's a timer that then shuts them down. Any of the travel would be designed to come in from away from the neighborhood and come in in the least disruptive way. And so the EMS teams work that out in advance. If you think about those times when 22, every back road completely jammed and someone needs intervention, that helicopter is the difference between life and death. It's, it's that straightforward. Very, very few times it will be used. But when it's used, it will be needed. You're talking about okay. here? Above municipal, right. Most likely we, we would come in from this angle. The distance, I don't, I, I don't have Excuse that distance. Me. If we could, can we keep all comments till after their presentation? If they're I, presenting a plan, we can give you the time to understand the plan. I was at the meeting on Thursday. Well, and, and I, that's fine. It's just that this made the meeting go much longer, I think, than was possible. That's what the plan says. I, and, and I understand your concern. I'm not saying you can't ask questions. What I'm saying is I think you should put it out there, and then you can go ahead and refer back. That's all. You'll get that opportunity, though.
Okay. And we can, you, we can look at ways that it can be screened. So, uh, because we do want to be good neighbors. We work closely with neighbors in our other uh, locations. So that's the, that, that's the, the, the meat of what we're talking about developing. Let me walk through a couple of other pieces just for perspective. The commissioners don't have this, you will have when I finish my presentation. Okay, so we want to take a minute and talk about where things are today. There, there was a very clear set of feedback. Traffic, 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 safety relative to the roads. Did I miss anything? can't go in yes all of that so let's talk about where we are today today it's a cornfield and there's a lot of concern about traffic correct here's the tree line the tree line would stay in place if a health campus is developed right here is a roadway connection behind the trees here is the other right in right out this land today is zoned residential. You can fit about 154 residential lots on this land. If a developer came to us and made us the proverbial offer that no one could refuse, they could build 154 lots, connect to 145 here, connect to 145 there, at Lehigh Street, and that would be the extent of their obligations. We already have, we've had for quite some time, the highway occupancy permits. So residential connects to MacArthur Road, no other improvements. That's current state. back in here not the entirety there there is a there are some wetlands wet areas in there there's a very clear area I'll defer to an engineer in a moment there's a very clear area where you could put homes and and the 154 uh, number accounts for that area 102 down here, north, when we went back, did all the calculations. You're right, I said 102. In the space that's covered by the healthcare overlay is 102. In the entirety of the track, tract, 154 could all be emptied onto 145. The healthcare overlay covers where 102 could be built. That's the yellow outline over there. Okay, the 154 covers all of it. And you can see the darker green. That's the, that's the wet area that you're concerned about. Okay. So hearing that feedback, Again, I apologize for my back. See, You've got it. Keep okay. Around, I can see it. Okay. And we will. Is that okay with you, Clay? Yeah. We should be using the screens. That's what we yes. paid for, right? Yeah. I don't understand why we're not using screens. And, and, we'll, and we will get you a packet so you've got a hard copy. So we've tried to take in as much of the input that we could in terms of traffic and other issues and believe there's a way that a health campus and traffic improvement can be accomplished all at once. I've asked our engineer, Scott Pidcock, to walk through it so that you can see 
all the different elements that would come into play if this were a health campus. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Pidcock. Are, are you able to see this indirectly or? You can see it on the screen, we can see it. So if you move it that we can. Let, let me do this. I, I appreciate you all want to see it, and you can appreciate they want to see it. Let me the exhibit, and then back to you, okay? So then you're all working from the, the same benefit. Can the board see this? Okay. There are things we can agree on. And between last Monday and then a very productive discussion Thursday evening at Fellowship Manor, it's clear that even today, with a cornfield generating no traffic, Mechanicsville in particular is a problem, a big problem. Right? We understand that. We've taken good notes. And we've uh, applied a lot of analysis to the information we've picked up from our conversations with the commissioners, with the citizens. And between last Monday and last Thursday, we have significant adjustments which we think we can accomplish we can make this happen and these are improvements that you clearly won't see from a cornfield and you certainly will not see from a residential development. The residential development is a plug and play arrangement. The curb cuts are there. They are permitted to carry 154 homes. And that will be the extent of the improvement that any residential development needs to make for the entirety of the health network's property. We think we can do better than that. So what the exhibit shows, and let me walk through this quickly, and you will all tick off on the list of things we've spoken about because I think that we can hit most of them. Most importantly, by reconfiguring the roads internal to our tract, we can create a Mechanicsville bypass, which will use what was our driveway to redirect traffic that otherwise would have gone down Mechanicsville to an intersection with 145. give that traffic a far preferable option to turn left on the orange road, travel along the bypass to the intersection at Lehigh Street, which is signalized. We have detailed traffic counts, and we, we know from those counts, and it's no surprise to you, that a lot of the traffic that is eastbound on Mechanicsville turns left onto 145 and then turns right on Lehigh Street to continue east. There is another segment of that left turning traffic that goes north. But there is a very significant movement eastbound on Mechanicsville, left on 
MacArthur, and then immediately right on Lehigh Street. And that same movement happens in the reverse. So there is westbound traffic on Lehigh Street, left on MacArthur, right and heading west on Mechanicsville Road. That accounts for a significant, not all, but a significant piece of the congestion that you folks have made clear to us you're living with virtually all the time. By giving that a bypass, an outlet, much of the traffic that is causing the congestion in front of the school, which is further impacted by this traffic, is redirected. To say it simply, the only way to, to make Mechanicsville better than it is today is to take traffic off of Mechanicsville. And that's what we propose to do. That's what the bypass does. At the intersection of this bypass, which crosses the property we're acquiring from Bethel Cemetery, we would install a traffic signal, a new traffic signal at that point. Now you may recall that in our conversations over the last several months, it was asked of us, could we put a traffic signal in here? And I told you we could not. And were it a private driveway, which was originally what we proposed, such that it was only carrying traffic associated with our healthcare campus, we would not have generated enough traffic to warrant, PennDOT's word for qualify, for a traffic signal. When we convert this into a bypass and obviously are now handling not only campus-related traffic, but traffic that is not in any way interacting with the campus, but is heading east, the volume of traffic on this bypass goes up appreciably. And when it does, we then meet the warrants, the qualifications for installing a signal on Mechanicsville, and we would. So that is part of our road Number three, and I promise I'll turn the board and we'll go over this all together. Number three is we have observed firsthand, sitting in the parking lot, watching carefully all times of day, what are the complications the school is experiencing, and they are several. But one of the opportunities we think exists is to install, think of it as an extended right turn lane in front of a portion of the school property without impacting the athletic fields such that it could connect to the westerly most of the three driveways for the school. And this allows traffic to leave the Mechanicsville stream earlier if it's bound for the school. When we spoke with these folks, they talked about crosswalks. A lot of pedestrian interest in getting without taking your life in your hands. Destinations, the school and the library, right? With the current level of traffic on Mechanicsville, and PennDOT has criteria for this, as they well should, because if there's a crosswalk, it had better be safe. With the current level of traffic on Mechanicsville, these crosswalks are not possible. With the bypass, they would be. 
So the purple dots, five and six, you see the pedestrian crossing icon. We've all seen them. It's the sign with the flashing yellow light, which is appropriate for busier streets, the white cross section painted on the pavement. There is a strong application that can be made for these crosswalks. I would quickly add, there are six criteria. Five we clearly meet, and the sixth is as long as there is enough pedestrian traffic to warrant it, right? That makes sense. In other words, one person crossing every other year, no crosswalk. If there's enough travel between the library, the school, and the neighborhood, and our impression from speaking with you is this would be a nice amenity. So as long as there is enough traffic, and that's part of the application to PennDOT, we think in all other respects we would qualify, and we would propose that we would install these. But understand it needs PennDOT's uh, acceptance of the volume of traffic to sustain it. You've heard us speak before, and we don't need to, to linger on this, but there are four intersections on MacArthur, Maple Drive, Lehigh Street, Mechanicsville itself, and Everhart, where we believe the enhancement we spoke to you about perhaps even a year ago, which is a technology-based enhancement. And PennDOT is doing a project that includes this technology, but they have decided that they, they are not going to include those four intersections be the, because it doesn't meet the so-called bang for the buck test. However, we have analyzed that. We have analyzed it with the people who generate the software. And our, our sense of it is that there are improvements that can be made at those four intersections with the technology, and we intend to make those. That is part of the program we're outlining for you tonight. There are several other items that we spoke, we spoke about, we spoke about. Rural road, where's Mary? Mary asked us, had we checked the site distance at Rural Road? We have now. And looking left, when on Rural Road, looking left to see oncoming cars, safe movement out of Rural Road, there is a site distance issue. It is largely <coughs> clearing vegetation out of the right of way. We're prepared to do that as well. Nine and 10 refer to the existing WTA property, which Mr. Dowery has already indicated. It has consistently been our intention, and we've shared that with this group, that it would remain as is. We are not intending to clear it. We're intending to maintain it. In addition to that, we are putting at the immediate back to the immediate north of the WTA property a new buffer. You've heard us describe that to you before. You've heard us talk about that. It includes a park, green trees. The way we think about it is back to now, make a new buffer, 75 feet wide, berms, trees. That is a very, very hearty, substantial buffer. Part of the buffering that we're willing to take on, we have to explore the property available to do it, is there are several neighbors, understandably, let me describe it, they are on the curve and closest to Lehigh, uh, to MacArthur Road. 
And they've raised some concern and asked, if possible, could we install additional buffering in there, and you'll see it on the exhibit in a second, that would somehow uh, intercept the lights turning into the property at night from the cars and protect those, those residences and the backyards. And we believe we can do that. The last, the last item on this list is that uh, there is an interest, and we have an interest, and we have this amenity at our other campuses. There is an interest in a pedestrian path. We would see a pedestrian path, and it's shown in the dashed blue line around the entirety of the 80 acres, and ultimately it could well head north. This is also our property, and as the township well knows, this is your property and intended to be uh, a park over time, I believe. Right. So to the extent that we can participate in kind of a larger macro planning effort for pedestrian activity within and beyond our property, that's what this shows. Be before I turn this slide to these folks, are there, any, are there any questions from the board or shall I first share it here and then we'll respond to whatever questions you might have? Okay, all right. Can everyone see this okay? Yeah. Okay. Here's Mechanicsville. <laughs> On your way. Oh. Here's Mechanicsville. Here's MacArthur. Let's walk through those improvements. <coughs> Number one in orange is the Mechanicsville bypass. This will become a, a new public thoroughfare. So whereas our front entrance, if you will, in our earlier master planning, began at the intersection Lehigh Street with MacArthur Road, that's no longer the case. This would be a public thoroughfare. This is the bypass to which, that's what these orange arrows are, to which the medical campus would attach. Number two, this is the new traffic signal. We believe we would qualify for this because this is now a public road. This bypass with this traffic signal will remove a lot, not all, but a lot of traffic from Mechanicsville over this segment, including in front of the school, from here, remove from here, and here, this is the traffic movement I was describing. We know about this because of our traffic counts. There's a lot of traffic now in Mechanicsville that routinely comes down, goes left, goes right, and does the reverse. There's also traffic that comes down, goes left, and goes north. So either, either of those drivers is far better off taking the bypass. I'm not sure I follow you. Why would, why would you want the left hand turn in Mechanicsville? Here? And, and the right. uh, that would be fine with us. That wouldn't be up to us. That would be. We'd be fine with that. I doubt PennDOT would, but no resistance from us on that. Okay? Three. Three. Excuse me. 
Uh, just yeah. because we have to record this and we have to know who's speaking during the recording. If <laughs> it's just impossible. I, I apologize. It's just, it's a public meeting and it needs to be recorded and we need to disseminate who's speaking and there's no way of doing that if you don't identify yourselves. That's why, you know, it, it's complicated to run a meeting like this, but it's unfortunate. I'll, I'll step quickly through these. We'll field the questions. I understand the point. No resistance from us on that. The road absolutely will be sized to carry the traffic. There's no question about that. Number three, this is the segment I was speaking about that we think would benefit the school. And we have to speak with the school. We look forward to that. But from what we assess some of their complications to be, and their, their overwhelming complication, which is not of their making, is that uh, the traffic stacks up so, so deep along Mechanicsville Road that it really um, makes it very difficult to use almost always one, most of the time two, and sometimes all three of the driveways. That's a problem. So we, we think with the bypass, the traffic signal, and the addition at our expense of a right turn lane that would allow traffic to leave the Mechanicsville stream and then basically access the school driveway earlier, that should be a tremendous improvement for the school. We look forward to talking to the school. Number four, the green circles. That's the technology uh, adjustment at each of those four intersections that we believe will also deliver some benefit. We've been talking about that one for about a year. There are signals there now. You know that. The crosswalks, the library, the school, if we can get, if we can put the bypass in and we can redirect the quantity of traffic we believe we can, then we believe we have a, a very competent application to file with PennDOT for permission to put the pedestrian crossings in here. You know what they look like. It's the yellow sign, it's the flashing lights, and it's the cross hatching on the pavement. Number seven is the sight distance issue at Rural Road. Looking right is, uh, is pretty clear, is, is our sense of that. There might be one shrub a couple houses down that might be in the right of way. That doesn't seem to be problematic. It's the looking left, trying to gauge the traffic which is coming from the left on Mechanicsville as you attempt to either cross or turn, turn into Mechanicsville. The enhanced buffering, WTA plus new buffer is occurring in here. We, that's okay. We shared with the group on Thursday night, and part of our plan is we are also installing a new buffer here. Obviously, there are neighbors here we think would appreciate that buffer. So the WTA property does not come down this segment, but our new buffer will be extended down on the neighborhood side of this road as well. And then the last item is the dashed blue line, which is the pedestrian uh, walking path. Our sense of it is that the township has, you know, much bigger vision about pedestrian trails and bike trails and that kind of thing, and so they should. It's a great amenity. 
to the extent that our property can participate in that and make some of that possible. We are interested in doing that. That's not a new concept. The Lehigh Valley current campuses have this kind of amenity and we would have it here. So th this is, we hope you find this to be a, a thoughtful and a compelling response to the discussion we've had over months really, but more to the point in the last week. We, we get it. It's a cornfield today and Mechanicsville is a problem today. How can it get better? The only way it's going to get appreciably better for, for you, for the township, is to take traffic off of Mechanicsville. And the only way to do that is with something that is as ambitious as this, which is putting in a new bypass. If we do that, the eastbound traffic that wants Lehigh Street will choose this every time. The westbound traffic that's coming on Lehigh Street will choose this any, every time, and most of the northbound traffic will far prefer this. And that should be a big, big improvement in everybody's experience of the traffic in this corridor. Before I switch it back, any? Yeah. 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 Uh, sir, no, sir, if you could please get the microphone and identify yourself. I apologize. That's understood, but we still need to identify who is speaking for the minutes. Um, I'm Mike Evans, uh, Sagittarius. Um, <laughs> Do you state your address, please? Uh, Columbia Street, Whitehall. Address, full address. 3476. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so your walking trail, who's going to maintain that? Because right now all of our walking trails are usually volunteers that take care of that. You're going to take care of that? Okay. All right. So, so you spice things up by calling this a bypass. Okay. So now all you did is you just took all this and just pushed it down the road farther. So you put more pressure on Rural Road, right? You put more pressure on Cyple Station, and also you put more pressure uh, at the end of uh, Mechanicsville Road for Monchunk to make that, okay? That's not right. Well, sure it is. So you have, now you're going to put a traffic light here, okay? So if PennDOT does traffic lights like they do around here, you're going to be waiting forever. So this traffic light's red, okay? So people are going to back up here, people are going to back up here. Now the people are coming down Rural, can't get out because it's all blocked up because of this traffic light. So people coming down here are also going to wait because they might want to turn here or turn out. So this is going to get backed up all the way up to Cyple Station. Well, I, I understand your point, but you're not correct. And let, look at it this way. And this, this doesn't take a degree in traffic engineering. Is it going to be better? with a lot of the traffic being able to use a new road to bypass Mechanicsville in front of the school in the intersection, or isn't it? And of course it's going to be better. It's going to be light years better. Do the traffic signals have to be coordinated so they don't turn into stutter stops along the way? Of course they do. Of course they do. It doesn't take engineering. It takes logic to realize that it's going to push the pressure back. Also, too, if there's people that are going to cross, and they're crossing, so now cars got to stop here, cars got to stop here. Likewise, going both ways. And also, also, if you're going to put this right lane in here to make access to the school, you just took away parking spots for um, the uh, gymnasium, aren't you? Or you're going to, or, act or actually, uh, if you're showing here the field, so you're going to take away from the practice field. Can I respond? Yeah. Yeah. No, there aren't any parking spaces there today. Well, no, I just looked at that now. Okay. We're going to take away from the football field. We're not. We're not. We've looked at it carefully enough to know that we're not going to disrupt the, okay. that. I already know you've got to back up the, the fencing there for the baseball field. Uh, we have no intention of removing any of the athletic facilities. This could be right up against it, but, I mean, 
once again, setting aside engineering and go to pure, pure logic, you'll notice that. Thanks very much. Sure. Right. The crosswalks, the crosswalks we understood, the community had an interest in those. If we've misunderstood that, we'd be happy to delete the crosswalks. No, no we want the crosswalks. Thank you. All right. I, I understand. If we could, what would you like? if you gentlemen could just finish your presentation, and then we're going to, all questions can be asked during your three minutes after their presentation, because we can't go back and forth. We're, we're going to be here till the end of time. Let's turn it back to the board. Ed, here's the... Uh... So, so to wrap it up, we thought it would be helpful to, to walk through the different We thought it would be helpful to walk through the, the different components of where we are today and what it might look like in the future scenarios. So the farm field, in terms of future use, the farm field is a temporary use until something is developed there. It, it, that's the first part. In a farm field or residential, which is allowed by right, it's, it's the zoning, there's no emergency room, no diagnostic testing, no imaging. You don't get more doctors. You don't save th anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes of round trip travel to get to a hospital. The ambulance response times remain long. With a hospital, the ambulance response times can be cut significantly no bypass or any of the other elements that we just talked about. 